essay twenty five of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty five beer and cider by george saintsbury how pleasant it is to find the famous professor saintsbury known to students as the author of histories of the english and french literatures the history of criticism and history of english prosody spending the evening so hospitably in his cellar i print this from his downright delightful notes on a cellar book as a kind of tantalizing penance it is a charming example of how pleasantly a great scholar can unbend on occasion george saintsbury born in eighteen forty five studied at merton college oxford taught school eighteen sixty eight to seventy six was a journalist in london eighteen seventy six to ninety five and held the chair of english literature at edinburgh university eighteen ninety five to nineteen fifteen if you read notes on a cellar book as you should you will agree that it is a charmingly light-hearted causerie for a gentleman to publish at the age of seventy five more than ever one feels that sound liquor in moderation is a preservative of both body and wit there is no beverage which i have liked to live with more than beer but i have never had a cellar large enough to accommodate much of it or an establishment numerous enough to justify the accommodation in the good days when servants expected beer but did not expect to be treated otherwise than as servants a cask or two was necessary and persons who were quite generally took care that the small beer they drank should be the same as that which they gave to their domestics though they might have other sorts as well for these better sorts at least the good old rule was when you began on one cask always to have in another even cobbett whose belief in beer was the noblest feature in his character allowed that it required some keeping the curious white ale or lober agol which within the memory of man used to exist in devonshire and cornwall but which even half a century ago i have vainly sought there was i believe drunk quite new but then it was not pure malt and not hopped at all but had eggs pullet sperm in the brewage and other foreign bodies in it i did once drink at st david's ale so new that it frothed from the cask as creamily as if it had been bottled and i wondered whether the famous beer of bala which borrow found so good at his first visit and so bad at his second had been like it footnote this visit in the early eighties had another relish the inn coffee-room had a copy of mr freeman's book on the adjoining cathedral and this was copiously annotated in a beautiful and scholarly hand but in a most virulent spirit why can't you call things by their plain names in reference to the historian's macaulay-esque paraphrases etc i have often wondered who the annotator was End footnote on the other hand the very best bass i ever drank had had an exactly contrary experience in the year eighteen seventy five when i was resident at elgin i and a friend now dead the procurator fiscal of the district devoted the may sacrament holidays which were then still kept in those remote parts to a walking tour up the findhorn and across to loch ness and glen urquhart at the freeburn inn on the first named river we found some beer of singular excellence and asking the damsel who waited on us about it were informed that a cask of bass had been put in during the previous october but owing to a sudden break in the weather and the departure of all visitors had never been tapped till our arrival beer of ordinary strength left too long in the cask gets hard of course but no one who deserves to drink it should drink it from anything but the cask if he could help it jars are makeshifts though useful makeshifts and small beer will not keep in them for much more than a week nor are the very small barrows known by various affectionate diminutives pen etc 
in the country districts much to be recommended we'll drink it in the firkin my boy is the lowest admission in point of volume that should be allowed of one such firkin i have a pleasant memory and memorial though it never reposed in my home cellar it was just before the present century opened and some years before we professors in scotland had of our own motion and against considerable opposition given up half of the old six months holiday without asking for or receiving a penny more salary i have since chuckled at the horror and wrath with which mr smilly and mr thomas would hear of such profligate conduct one could therefore move about with fairly long halts and i had taken from a friend a house at abingdon for some time so though i could not even then drink quite as much beer as i could thirty years earlier a little higher up the thames it became necessary to procure a cask it came one of bass's minor mildnesses affectionately labelled mr george saintsbury full to the bung i detached the card and i believe i have it to this day as my choicest because quite unsolicited testimonial very strong beer permits itself of course to be bottled and kept in bottles but i rather doubt whether it also is not best from the wood though it is equally of course much easier to cellar it and keep it bottled its kinds are various and curious scotch ale is famous and at its best i never drank better than younger's excellent but its tendency i think is to be too sweet i once invested in some not younger's which i kept for nearly sixteen years and which was still treacle at the end bass's number one requires no praises once when living in the cambridgeshire village mentioned earlier i had some bottled in cambridge itself of great age and excellence indeed two guests though both of them were cambridge men and should have had what mr lang once called the robust habits of that university fell into one ditch after partaking of it i own that the lanes thereabouts are very dark in former days though probably not at present you could often find rather choice specimens of strong beer produced at small breweries in the country i remember such even in the channel islands and i suspect the universities themselves have been subject to declensions and fallings off i know that in my undergraduate days at merton we always had proper beer glasses like the old flute champagnes served regularly at cheese time with a most notable beer called archdeacon which was then actually brewed in the sacristy of the college chapel i have since a slight sorrow to season the joy of reinstatement there been told that it is now obtained from outside footnote when i went up this march to help man the last ditch for greek i happened to mention archdeacon and my interlocutor told me that he believed no college now brewed within its walls after the defeat i thought of the stages of the decline and fall of things and how a sad but noble ode might be written by the right man on the fates of greek and beer at oxford he would probably refer in the first strophe to the close of the eumenides in its antistrophe to mr swinburne's great adaptation thereof in regard to carlyle and newman while the epode and any reduplication of the parts would be occupied by showing how the departing entities were of no equivocal magnificent like the eumenides themselves of no flawed perfection at least as it seemed to their poet like the two great english writers but wholly admirable and beneficent too good for the generation who would banish them and whom they banished End footnote and all souls is the only other college in which from actual recent experience i can imagine the possibility of the exorcism strong birums decidit alle fratre petro if lay brother peter were so silly as to abuse or play tricks with the good gift i have never had many experiences of real home brood but two which i had were pleasing 
There was much home brewing in East Anglia at the time I lived there, and I once got the village carpenter to give me some of his own manufacture. It was as good light ale as I ever wished to drink, many times better than the wretched stuff that Dora has foisted on us, and he told me that counting in every expense for material, cost, wear of plant, etc., it came to about a penny a quart. Footnote. This was one of the best illustrations of the old phrase, a good pennyworth, that I ever knew for certain. I add the two last words because of a mysterious incident of my youth. I and one of my sisters were sitting at a window in a certain seaside place, when we heard, both of us distinctly and repeatedly, the mystic street cry, a Bible and a pillowcase for a penny. I rushed downstairs to secure this bargain, but the crier was now far off, and it was too late. End footnote. The other was very different. The late Lord de Tabley, better or at least longer known as Mr. Lester Warren, once gave a dinner at the Athenaeum at which I was present, and had up from his Cheshire cellars some of the old ale for which that county is said to be famous, to make flip after dinner. It was shunned by most of the pusillanimous guests, but not by me, and it was excellent but I should like to have tried it unflipped. Footnote. By the way, are they still as good for flip at New College, Oxford, as they were in the days when it numbered hardly any undergraduates except scholars, and one scholar of my acquaintance had to himself a set of three rooms and a garden? And is the island at Kennington still famous for the same excellent compound? End footnote. I never drank mum, which all know from the antiquary, some from the rhyme of Sir Lancelot Bogle, and some again from the notice which Mr. Gladstone's love of Scott, may it plead for him, gave it once in some budget debate, I think. It is said to be brewed of wheat, which is not in its favour, wheat was meant to be eaten, not drunk, and very bitter, which is. Nearly all bitter drinks are good. The only time I ever drank spruce beer, I did not like it. The comeliest of black malts is, of course, that noble liquor called of Guinness. Here, at least, I think England cannot match Ireland, for our stouts are, as a rule, too sweet and clammy. But there used to be in the country districts a sort of light porter which was one of the most refreshing liquids conceivable for hot weather. I have drunk it in Yorkshire at the foot of Rosebury Topping, out of big stone bottles like champagne magnums. But that was nearly sixty years ago. Genuine lager beer is no more to be boycotted than genuine hock, though, by the way, the best that I ever drank, it was at the good town of King's Lynn, was low, not high, Dutch, in origin. It was so good that I wrote to the shippers at Rotterdam to see if I could get some sent to Leith, but the usual difficulties in establishing connection between wholesale dealers and individual buyers prevented this. It was, however, something of a consolation to read the delightful name, Our Top and Bottom Fermentation Beer, in which the manufacturer's letter, in very sound English for the most part, spoke of it. English lager, I must say, I have never liked. Perhaps I have been unlucky in my specimens. And good as Scotch strong beer is, I cannot say that the lighter and medium kinds are very good in Scotland. In fact, in Edinburgh, I used to import beer of this kind from Lincolnshire, where there is no mistake about it. Footnote. It came from Alford, the chef -lieu, if it cannot be called the capital of the Tennyson country. I have pleasant associations with the place, quite independent of the beery ones, and it made me, partially at least, alter one of the ideas of my early criticism, that time spent on a poet's local habitations was rather wasted. I have always thought the dying swan one of its author's greatest things and one of the champion examples of pure poetry in english literature but i never fully heard the eddying song that flooded 
the creeping mosses and clambering weeds and the willow branches o'er and dank and the wavy swell of the soughing reeds and the wave-worn horns of the echoing bank and the silvery marish flowers that throng the desolate creeks and pools among till i saw them End footnote my own private opinion is that john barleycorn north of tweed says i am for whiskey and not for ale cider and perry says burton are windy drinks yet he observes that the inhabitants of certain shires in england he does not i am sorry to say mention devon of normandy in france and of huispusoa in spain are no whit offended by them i have never liked perry on the few occasions on which i have tasted it perhaps because its taste has always reminded me of the smell of some stuff that my nurse used to put on my hair when i was small but i certainly have been no whit offended by cider either in diverse english shires including very specially those which burton does not include devon dorset and somerset or in normandy the huispuscon variety i have unfortunately had no opportunity of tasting besides perry seems to me to be an abuse of that excellent creature the pear whereas cider apples furnish one of the most cogent arguments to prove that providence had the production of alcoholic liquors directly in its eye they are good for nothing else whatever and they are excellent good for that i think i like the weak ciders such as those of the west and the normandy better than the stronger ones and draught cider much better than bottled footnote herfordshire and worcestershire cider can be very strong and the perry they say still stronger End footnote. that of norfolk which has been commended of late i have never tasted but i have had both western and west midland cider in my cellar often in bottle and once or twice in cask it is a pity that the liquor extremely agreeable to the taste one of the most thirst quenching to be anywhere found of no overpowering alcoholic strength as a rule and almost sovereign for gout is not to be drunk without caution and sometimes has to be given up altogether from other medical aspects qualified with brandy a mixture which was first imparted to me at a roadside inn by a very amiable dorsetshire farmer whom i met while walking from sherborne to blandford in my first oxford long it is capital and cider cup who knoweth not if there be any such let him not wait longer than to-morrow before establishing knowledge as for the pure juice of the apple four gallons a day per man used to be the harvest allowance in somerset when i was a boy it is refreshing only to think of it now of mead or methglen the third indigenous liquor of southern britain i know little indeed i should have known nothing at all of it had it not been that the parish clerk and sexton of the cambridgeshire village where i lived and the caretaker of a vinery which i rented was a beekeeper and mead maker he gave me some once i did not care much for it it was like a sweet weak beer with of course the special honey flavour but i should imagine that it was susceptible of a great many different modes of preparation and it is obvious considering what it is made of that it could be brewed of almost any strength old literary notices generally speak of it as strong end of essay twenty five essay twenty six of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty six a free man's worship by bertrand russell a free man's worship was written in nineteen o two it was republished by mr russell in nineteen eighteen in his volume mysticism and logic it is interesting to note carefully mr russell's view in this fine essay in connection with the fact that he was imprisoned by the british government as a pacifist during the war 
much of mr russell's writing in mathematical and philosophical fields is above the head of the desultory reader but so stimulating a paper as this one should not be neglected by the moderately inquisitive amateur bertrand russell was born in eighteen seventy two studied at trinity college cambridge and is widely known as a thinker of uncompromising liberalism to dr faustus in his study mephistopheles told the history of the creation saying the endless praises of the choirs of angels had begun to grow wearisome for after all did he not deserve their praise had he not given them endless joy would it not be more amusing to obtain undeserved praise to be worshipped by beings whom he tortured he smiled inwardly and resolved that the great drama should be performed for countless ages the hot nebula swirled aimlessly through space at length it began to take shape the central mass threw off planets the planets cooled boiling seas and burning mountains heaved and tossed from black masses of cloud hot sheets of rain deluged the barely solid crust and now the first germ of life grew in the depths of the ocean and developed rapidly in the fructifying warmth into vast forest trees huge ferns springing from the damp mould sea monsters breeding fighting devouring and passing away and from the monsters as the play unfolded itself man was born with the power of thought the knowledge of good and evil and the cruel thirst for worship and man saw that all is passing in this mad monstrous world that all is struggling to snatch at any cost a few brief moments of life before death's inexorable decree and man said there is a hidden purpose could we but fathom it and the purpose is good for we must reverence something and in the visible world there is nothing worthy of reverence and man stood aside from the struggle resolving that god intended harmony to come out of chaos by human efforts and when he followed the instincts which god had transmitted to him from his ancestry of beasts of prey he called it sin and asked god to forgive him but he doubted whether he could be justly forgiven until he invented a divine plan by which god's wrath was to have been appeased and seeing the present was bad he made it yet worse that thereby the future might be better and he gave god thanks for the strength that enabled him to forego even the joys that were possible and god smiled and when he saw that man had become perfect in renunciation and worship he sent another sun through the sky which crashed into man's sun and all returned again to nebula yes he murmured it was a good play i will have it performed again such in outline but even more purposeless more void of meaning is the world which science presents for our belief amid such a world if anywhere our ideals henceforward must find a home that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving that his origin his growth his hopes and fears his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms that no fire no heroism no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave that all the labors of the ages all the devotion all the inspiration all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins all these things if not quite beyond dispute are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand only within the scaffolding of these truths only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built how in such an alien and inhuman world can so powerless a creature as man preserve his aspirations untarnished a strange mystery it is that nature omnipotent but blind in the revolutions of her secular hurryings through the abysses of space has brought forth at last a child subject still to her power but gifted with sight with knowledge of good and evil with the capacity of judging all the works of his unthinking mother in spite of death the mark and seal of the parental control man is yet free during his brief years to examine to criticize to know and in imagination to create 
to him alone in the world with which he is acquainted this freedom belongs and in this lies his superiority to the resistless forces that control his outward life the savage like ourselves feels the oppression of his impotence before the powers of nature but having in himself nothing that he respects more than power he is willing to prostrate himself before his gods without inquiring whether they are worthy of his worship pathetic and very terrible is the long history of cruelty and torture of degradation and human sacrifice endured in the hope of placating the jealous gods surely the trembling believer thinks when what is most precious has been freely given their lust for blood must be appeased and more will not be required the religion of moloch as such creeds may be generically called is in essence the cringing submission of the slave who dare not even in his heart allow the thought that his master deserves no adulation since the independence of ideals is not yet acknowledged power may be freely worshipped and receive an unlimited respect despite its wanton infliction of pain but gradually as morality grows bolder the claim of the ideal world begins to be felt and worship if it is not to cease must be given to gods of another kind than those created by the savage some though they feel the demands of the ideal will still consciously reject them still urging that naked power is worthy of worship such is the attitude inculcated in god's answer to job out of the whirlwind the divine power and knowledge are paraded but of the divine goodness there is no hint such also is the attitude of those who in our own day base their morality upon the struggle for survival maintaining that the survivors are necessarily the fittest but others not content with an answer so repugnant to the moral sense will adopt the position which we have become accustomed to regard as specially religious maintaining that in some hidden manner the world of fact is really harmonious with the world of ideals thus man creates god all-powerful and all-good the mystic unity of what is and what should be but the world of fact after all is not good and in submitting our judgment to it there is an element of slavishness from which our thoughts must be purged for in all things it is well to exalt the dignity of man by freeing him as far as possible from the tyranny of non-human power when we have realized that power is largely bad that man with his knowledge of good and evil is but a helpless atom in a world which has no such knowledge the choice is again presented to us shall we worship force or shall we worship goodness shall our god exist and be evil or shall he be recognized as the creation of our own conscience the answer to this question is very momentous and affects profoundly our whole morality the worship of force to which carlyle and nietzsche and the creed of militarism have accustomed us is the result of failure to maintain our own ideals against a hostile universe it is itself a prostrate submission to evil a sacrifice of our best to moloch if strength indeed is to be respected let us respect rather the strength of those who refuse that false recognition of facts which fails to recognize that facts are often bad let us submit that in the world we know there are many things that would be better otherwise and that the ideals to which we do and must adhere are not realized in the realm of matter let us preserve our respect for truth for beauty for the ideal of perfection which life does not permit us to attain though none of these things meet with the approval of the unconscious universe if power is bad as it seems to be let us reject it from our hearts in this lies man's true freedom in determination to worship only the god created by our own love of the good to respect only the heaven which inspires the insight of our best moments in action in desire we must submit perpetually to the tyranny of outside forces but in thought in aspiration we are free free from our fellow-men free from the petty planet on which our bodies impotently crawl free even while we live from the tyranny of death 
let us learn then that energy of faith which enables us to live constantly in the vision of the good and let us descend in action into the world of fact with that vision always before us when first the opposition of fact and ideal grows fully visible a spirit of fiery revolt of fierce hatred of the gods seems necessary to the assertion of freedom to defy with promethean constancy a hostile universe to keep its evil always in view always actively hated to refuse no pain that the malice of power can invent appears to be the duty of all who will not bow before the inevitable but indignation is still a bondage for it compels our thoughts to be occupied with an evil world and in the fierceness of desire from which rebellion springs there is a kind of self-assertion which it is necessary for the wise to overcome indignation is a submission of our thoughts but not of our desires the stoic freedom in which wisdom consists is found in the submission of our desires but not of our thoughts from the submission of our desires springs the virtue of resignation from the freedom of our thoughts springs the whole world of art and philosophy and the vision of beauty by which at last we have conquered the reluctant world but the vision of beauty is possible only to unfettered contemplation to thoughts not weighed by the goad of eager wishes and thus freedom comes only to those who no longer ask of life that it shall yield them any of those personal goods that are subject to the mutations of time although the necessity of renunciation is evidence of the existence of evil yet christianity in preaching it has shown a wisdom exceeding that of the promethean philosophy of rebellion it must be admitted that of the things we desire some though they prove impossible are yet real goods others however as ardently longed for do not form part of a fully purified ideal the belief that what must be renounced is bad though sometimes false is far less often false than untamed passion supposes and the creed of religion by providing a reason for proving that it is never false has been the means of purifying our hopes by the discovery of many austere truths but there is in resignation a further good element even real goods when they are unattainable ought not to be fretfully desired to every man comes sooner or later the great renunciation for the young there is nothing unattainable a good thing desired with the whole force of a passionate will and yet impossible is to them not credible yet by death by illness by poverty or by the voice of duty we must learn each one of us that the world was not made for us and that however beautiful may be the things we crave for fate may nevertheless forbid them it is the part of courage when misfortune comes to bear without repining the ruin of our hopes to turn away our thoughts from vain regrets this degree of submission to power is not only just and right it is the very gate of wisdom but passive renunciation is not the whole wisdom for not by renunciation alone can we build a temple for the worship of our own ideals haunting foreshadowings of the temple appear in the realm of imagination in music in architecture in the untroubled kingdom of reason and in the golden sunset magic of lyrics where beauty shines and glows remote from the touch of sorrow remote from the fear of change remote from the failures and disenchantments of the world of fact in the contemplation of these things the vision of heaven will shape itself in our hearts giving at once a touchstone to judge the world about us and an inspiration by which to fashion to our needs whatever is not incapable of serving as a stone in the sacred temple except for those rare spirits that are born without sin there is a cavern of darkness to be traversed before that temple can be entered the gate of the cavern is despair and its floor is paved with the gravestones of abandoned hopes there self must die there the eagerness the greed of untamed desire must be slain for only so can the soul be freed from the empire of fate but out of the caverns the gate of renunciation leads again to the daylight of wisdom 
by whose radiance a new insight a new joy a new tenderness shine forth to gladden the pilgrim's heart when without the bitterness of impotent rebellion we have learnt both to resign ourselves to the outward rule of fate and to recognize that the non-human world is unworthy of our worship it becomes possible at last so to transform and refashion the unconscious universe so to transmute it in the crucible of imagination that a new image of shining gold replaces the old idol of clay in all the multiform facts of the world in the visual shapes of trees and mountains and clouds in the events of the life of man even in the very omnipotence of death the insight of creative idealism can find the reflection of a beauty which its own thoughts first made in this way mind asserts its subtle mastery over the thoughtless forces of nature the more evil the material with which it deals the more thwarting to untrained desire the greater is its achievement in inducing the reluctant rock to yield up its hidden treasures the prouder its victory in compelling the opposing forces to swell the pageant of its triumph of all the arts tragedy is the proudest the most triumphant for it builds its shining citadel in the very centre of the enemy's country on the very summit of his highest mountain from its impregnable watch-towers his camps and arsenals his columns and forts are all revealed within its walls the free life continues while the legions of death and pain and despair and all the servile captains of tyrant fate afford the burghers of that dauntless city new spectacles of beauty happy those sacred ramparts thrice happy the dwellers on that all-seeing eminence honor to those brave warriors who through countless ages of warfare have preserved for us the priceless heritage of liberty and have kept undefiled by sacrilegious invaders the home of the unsubdued but the beauty of tragedy does not make visible a quality which in more or less obvious shapes is present always and everywhere in life in the spectacle of death in the endurance of intolerable pain and in the irrevocableness of a vanished past there is a sacredness an overpowering awe a feeling of the vastness the depth the inexhaustible mystery of existence in which as by some strange marriage of pain the sufferer is bound to the world by bonds of sorrow in these moments of insight we lose all eagerness of temporary desire all struggling and striving for petty ends all care for the little trivial things that to a superficial view make up the common life of day by day we see surrounding the narrow raft illumined by the flickering light of human comradeship the dark ocean on whose rolling waves we toss for a brief hour from the great night without a chill blast breaks in upon our refuge all the loneliness of humanity amid hostile forces is concentrated upon the individual soul which must struggle alone with what of courage it can command against the whole weight of a universe that cares nothing for its hopes and fears victory in the struggle with the powers of darkness is the true baptism into the glorious company of heroes the true initiation into the overmastering beauty of human existence from that awful encounter of the soul with the outer world renunciation wisdom and charity are born and with their birth a new life begins to take into the inmost shrine of the soul the irresistible forces whose puppets we seem to be death and change the irrevocableness of the past and the powerlessness of man before the blind hurry of the universe from vanity to vanity to feel these things and know them is to conquer them this is the reason why the past has much magical power the beauty of its motionless and silent pictures is like the enchanted purity of late autumn when the leaves though one breath would make them fall still glow against the sky in golden glory the past does not change or strive like duncan after life's fitful fever it sleeps well 
what was eager and grasping what was petty and transitory has faded away the things that are beautiful and eternal shine out of it like stars in the night its beauty to a soul not worthy of it is unendurable but to a soul which has conquered fate it is the key of religion the life of man viewed outwardly is but a small thing in comparison with the forces of nature the slave is doomed to worship time and fate and death because they are greater than anything he finds in himself and because all his thoughts are of things which they devour but great as they are to think of them greatly to feel their passionless splendor is greater still and such thought makes us free men we no longer bow before the inevitable in oriental subjection but we absorb it and make it a part of ourselves to abandon the struggle for private happiness to expel all eagerness of temporary desire to burn with passion for eternal things this is emancipation and this is the free man's worship and this liberation is effected by a contemplation of fate for fate itself is subdued by the mind which leaves nothing to be purged by the purifying fire of time united with his fellow-men by the strongest of all ties the tie of a common doom the free man finds that a new vision is with him always shedding over every daily task the light of love the life of man is a long march through the night surrounded by invisible foes tortured by weariness and pain towards a goal that few can hope to reach and where none may tarry long one by one as they march our comrades vanish from our sight seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death very brief is the time in which we can help them in which their happiness or misery is decided be it ours to shed sunshine on their path to lighten their sorrows by the balm of sympathy to give them the pure joy of a never tiring affection to strengthen failing courage to instill faith in hours of despair let us not weigh in grudging scales their merits and demerits but let us think only of their need of the sorrows the difficulties perhaps the blindness that make the misery of their lives let us remember that they are fellow-sufferers in the same darkness actors in the same tragedy with ourselves and so when their day is over when their good and their evil have become eternal by the immortality of the past be it ours to feel that where they suffered where they failed no deed of ours was the cause but wherever a spark of the divine fire kindled in their hearts we were ready with encouragement with sympathy with brave words in which high courage glowed brief and powerless is man's life on him and on his race the slow sure doom falls pitiless and dark blind to good and evil reckless of destruction omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way for man condemned to-day to lose his dearest to-morrow himself to pass through the gate of darkness it remains only to cherish ere yet the blow falls the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day disdaining the coward terrors of the slave of fate to worship at the shrine that his own hands have built undismayed by the empire of chance to preserve a mind free from the wanton tyranny that rules his outward life proudly defiant of the irresistible forces that tolerate for a moment his knowledge and his condemnation to sustain alone a weary but unyielding atlas the world that his own ideals have fashioned despite the trampling march of unconscious power end of essay twenty six essay twenty seven of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty seven some historians by philip guadalla philip guadalla born eighteen eighty nine is a london barrister and at the present time an independent liberal candidate for the house of commons he has written excellent light verse and parodies and a textbook on european history seventeen fifteen to eighteen fifteen 
His most conspicuous achievement so far is the brilliant volume Supers and Supermen, from which my selection is taken. Supers and Supermen is a collection of historical and political portraits and skits. It is mercilessly and gloriously humorous. Those who can always follow the wit and irony that Guadalla knows how to conceal in a cunningly turned phrase will find the book a prodigious delight. He has an unerring eye for the absurd. His paradoxes, when pondered, have a way of proving excellent truth. Truth is sometimes like the furniture in Through the Looking Glass, which could only be reached by resolutely walking away from it. Ten years ago Mr. Guadalla was considered the most continuously and insolently brilliant undergraduate of the Oxford of that day. The charm and vigor of his ironical wit have not lessened since his fellow undergraduates strove to convince themselves that no man could be as clever as P. G. seemed to be. When Mr. Guadalla holds the mirror up to Nietzsche, or gives thanks that Britons never, never will be Slavs, or dynastizes henry james into three reigns james the first james the second and the old pretender or when he speaks of the cheerful clatter of sir james barry's cans as he went round with the milk of human kindness there will be some who will sigh but there will also i hope be many who will forgive the bravado for the quicksilver wit it was quintilian or mr max beerbohm who said History repeats itself. Historians repeat each other. The saying is full of the mellow wisdom of either writer, and stamped with the peculiar veracity of the silver age of Roman or British epigram. One might have added, if the aphorist had stayed for an answer, that history is rather interesting when it repeats itself. Historians are not in france which is an enlightened country enjoying the benefits of the revolution and a public examination in rhetoric historians are expected to write in a single and classical style of french the result is sometimes a rather irritating uniformity it is one long tain that has no turning and any quotation may be attributed with safety to guizot because la nuit tous les chats sont gris but in england which is a free country the restrictions natural to ignorant and immoral foreigners are put off by the rough island race and history is written in a dialect which is not curable by education and cannot it would seem be prevented by injunction historians english is not a style it is an industrial disease the thing is probably scheduled in the workmen's compensation act and the publisher may be required upon notice of the attack to make a suitable payment to the writer's dependents the workers in this dangerous trade are required to adopt like mohammed's coffin a detached standpoint that is to write as if they took no interest in the subject since it is not considered good form for a graduate of less than sixty years standing to write upon any period that is either familiar or interesting this feeling is easily acquired and the resulting narrations present the dreary impartiality of the recording angel without that completeness which is the sole attraction of his style wilde complained of mr hall cain that he wrote at the top of his voice but a modern historian when he is really detached writes like some one talking in the next room and few writers have equalled the legal precision of cox's observation that the turks sawed the archbishop and the commandant in half and committed other grave violations of international law having purged his mind of all unsteadying interest in the subject the young historian should adopt a moral code of more than malthusian severity which may be learned from any american writer of the last century upon the renaissance or the decadence of spain this manner which is especially necessary in passages dealing with character will lend to his work the grave dignity that is requisite for translation into latin prose that supreme test of an historian's style it will be his misfortune to meet upon the byways of history the oddest and most abnormal persons 
and he should keep by him unless he wishes to forfeit his fellowship some convenient formula by which he may indicate at once the enormity of the subject and the disapproval of the writer the writings of Lord Macaulay will furnish him at need with the necessary facility in lightning characterization. It was the practice of Cicero to label his contemporaries without distinction as heavy men, and the characters of history are easily divisible into far-seeing statesmen and reckless libertines it may be objected that although it is sufficient for the purposes of contemporary caricature to represent mr gladstone as a collar or mr chamberlain as an eyeglass it is an inadequate record for posterity but it is impossible for a busy man to write history without formula and after all sheep are sheep and goats are goats lord macaulay once wrote of some one in private life he was stern morose and inexorable he was probably a dutchman it is a passage which has served as a lasting model for the historian's treatment of character i had always imagined that cliche was a suburb of paris until i discovered it to be a street in oxford thus if the working historian is faced with a period of deplorable excesses he handles it like a man and writes always as if he was illustrated with steel engravings the imbecile king now ripened rapidly towards a crisis surrounded by a court in which inanity of the day was rivalled only by the debauchery of the night he became incapable towards the year fourteen seventy two of distinguishing good from evil a fact which contributed considerably to the effectiveness of his foreign policy but was hardly calculated to conform with the monastic traditions of his house long nights of drink and dicing weakened a constitution that was already undermined and the council table where once campo santo had presided was disfigured with the despicable apparatus of bagatelle the burghers of the capital were horrified by the wild laughter of his madcap courtiers and when it was reported in london that ladislaus had played at halma the court of st james received his envoy in the deepest ceremonial mourning that is precisely how it is done the passage exhibits the benign and contemporary influences of lord macaulay and mr bowdler and it contains all the necessary ingredients except perhaps a venal chancellor and a greedy mistress vice is a subject of especial interest to historians who are in most cases residents in small county towns and there is unbounded truth in the rococo footnote of a writer on the renaissance who said apropos of a pope the disgusting details of his vices smack somewhat of the morbid historian's lamp the note itself is a fine example of that concrete visualization of the subject which led macaulay to observe that in consequence of frederick's invasion of silesia black men fought on the coast of coromandel and red men scalped each other by the great lakes of north america a less exciting branch of the historian's work is the reproduction of contemporary sayings and speeches thus an obituary should always close on a note of regretful quotation he lived in affluence and died in great pain thus it was said by the most eloquent of his contemporaries thus terminated a career as varied as it was eventful as strange as it was unique but for the longer efforts of sustained eloquence greater art is required it is no longer usual as in thucydides day to compose completely new speeches but it is permissible for the historian to heighten the colours and even to insert those rhetorical questions and complexes of personal pronouns which will render the translation of the passage into latin prose a work of consuming interest and lasting profit the duke assembled his companions for the forlorn hope and addressed them briefly in oratio oblica his father he said had always cherished in his heart the idea that he would one day return to his own people 
had he fallen in vain was it for nothing that they had dyed with their loyal blood the soil of a hundred battlefields the past was dead the future was yet to come let them remember that great sacrifices were necessary for the attainment of great ends let them think of their homes and families and if they had any pity for an exile an outcast and an orphan let them die fighting that is the kind of passage that used to send the blood of dr bradley coursing more quickly through his veins the march of its eloquence the solemnity of its sentiment and the rich balance of its pronouns unite to make it a model for all historians it can be adapted for any period it is not possible in a short review to include the special branches of the subject such are those efficient modern textbooks in which events are referred to either as factors as if they were a sum or as phases as if they were the moon there is also the solemn business of writing economic history in which the historian may lapse at will into algebra and anything not otherwise describable may be called social tissue a special subject is constituted by the early conquests of southern and central america in these there is a uniform opening for all passages running it was now the middle of october and the season was drawing to an end soon the mountains would be whitened with the snows of winter and every rivulet swollen to a roaring torrent cortez whose determination only increased with misfortune decided to delay his march until the inclemency of the season abated it was now the middle of november and the season was drawing to an end there is finally the method of military history this may be patriotic technical or in the manner prophetically indicated by virgil as belloc harida belloc the finest exponent of the patriotic style is undoubtedly the rev w h fitchett a distinguished colonial clergyman and historian of the napoleonic wars his night attacks are more nocturnal and his scaling parties are more heroically scaligerous than those of any other writer his drummer boys are the most moving in my limited circle of drummer boys one gathers that the peninsular war was full of pleasing incidents of this type the night attack it was midnight when staff surgeon pettigrew showed the flare from the summit of sombrero at once the whole plain was alive with the hum of the great assault the four columns speedily got into position with flares and bugles at the head of each one made straight for the water gate a second for the bailey guard a third for the porter house and the last led by the saintly smeath for the tube station let us follow the second column in its secret mission through the night lit by torches and cheered on by the huzzas of a thousand english throats blank the blanks cried cocker in a voice hoarse with patriotism at that moment a red-hot shot hurtled over the plain and ricocheting treacherously from the frozen river dashed the heroic leader to the ground captain boffskin of the buffs leaped up with the dry coughing howl of the british infantrymen blank them he roared and blank them to blank and for the last fifty yards it was neck and neck with the ladders our gallant dummer boys laid to again but suddenly a shot rang out from the silent ramparts the ninety-fourth leger were awake we were discovered the war of eighteen seventy requires more special treatment its histories show no particular characteristic but its appearance in fiction deserves special attention there is a standard pattern how the prussians came to gitry le sec it was a late afternoon in early september or an early afternoon in late september i forget these things when i missed the boat expressed from kerplurnik to pulisi le roy and was forced by the time-table to spend three hours at the forgotten hamlet of guitry le sec in the heart of dauphine it contained besides a quantity of underfed poultry one white church one white marie and nine white houses an old man with a white beard came towards me up the long white road it was on such an afternoon as this forty years ago he began that stop 
i said sharply i have met you in a previous existence you are going to say that a solitary uhlan appeared sharply outlined against the sky behind m jules farm he nodded feebly the red trousers had left the village half an hour before to look for the hated prussian in the cafes of the neighboring town you were alone when the spiked helmets marched in you can hear their shrieking fifes to this day he wept quietly i went on there was an officer with them a proud ugly man with a butter-colored moustache he saw the little mimi and drove his coarse swabian hand upward through his mecklenburger moustache you dropped on one knee but he had fled in the first of the three cafes i saw a second old man come in monsieur he said i waited on the doorstep it was on just such an afternoon i went on at the other two cafes two further old men attempted me with the story i told the last that he was rescued by zouaves and walked happily to the station to read about vichy celestins until the train came in from the south the russo-japanese war is a more original subject and derives its particular flavor from the airy grace with which sir ian hamilton has described it like this wa wa january thirty one the raphael was purring like a mistral as i shaved this morning i wonder where it is must ask blank blank is a charming fellow with the face of a baluchi kashki and a voice like a circular saw eleven forty it was eleven forty when i looked at my watch the shrapnel bursts looked like a plantation of powder puffs suspended in the sky victor says there is a battle going on capital chap victor two p m lunched with an american lady doctor how feminine the americans can be seven p m a great day it was donkelsdorp over again substitute the tenth army for the traffordshire's baggage wagon swell honk spreet into the roaring wang ho elevate oom um kop into the frowning scarp of pijiyama and you have it the staff were obviously gratified when i told them about donkelsdorp the ruskies came over the crest line in a huddle of massed battalions and gazika was after him like a rat after a terrier i knew that his horse guns had no horses a rule of the japanese service to discourage unnecessary changing of ground but his men bit the trails and dragged them up by their teeth slowly the muscovites peeled off the steaming mountain and took the funicular down the other side I wonder what my friend Smuts would make of the Yen Tai coal mine. Well, well, something accomplished, something done. The technical manner is more difficult of acquisition for the beginner, since it involves a knowledge of at least two European languages. It is a cardinal rule that all places should be described as point d'appui. The simple process of scouting looks far better as Verschleierung, and the adjective strategical may be used without any meaning in front of any noun. But the military manner was revolutionized by the war. Mr. Bella created a new land and a new water. We know now why the Persian commanders demanded earth and water on their entrance into a Greek town. It was the weekly demand of the great general staff as it called for its favorite paper mr belloc has woven baedeker and geometry into a new style it is the last cry of historians english because one was invented by a german and the other by a greek End of essay twenty seven Essay twenty eight of Modern Essays Selected by Christopher Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay twenty eight Winter Mist by Robert Palfrey Utter. Robert Palfrey Utter was born in eighteen seventy five in Olympia, Washington. He graduated from Harvard. I am sorry there are so many Harvard men in this book. I didn't know they were Harvard men until too late in eighteen ninety eight and took his ph d there in nineteen o six after a varied experience including editorial work on the youth's companion reporting on the new york evening post ranching in mexico and graduate study at harvard he went to amherst nineteen o six to eighteen as associate professor of english he was on the faculty of the a e f university at bon france 
1919, and in 1920 became Associate Professor of English at the University of California. Mr. Utter has contributed largely to the magazines and has published Guide to Good English, 1914, Everyday Words and Their Uses, 1916, and Everyday Pronunciation, 1918. Former students of his at Amherst have told me of the lasting stimulus his teaching has given them, that he can beautifully practice what he preaches of the art of writing, this essay shows. From a magazine with a rather cynical cover, I learned very recently that for pond skating the proper costume is brown homespun with a fur collar on the jacket, whereas for private rinks one wears a grey herringbone suit and taupe-coloured alpine. Oh, barren years that I have been a skater and no one told me of this! And here's another thing. I was patiently trying to acquire a counter-turn under the idle gaze of a hockey player who had no better business till the others arrived than to watch my efforts. What I don't see about that game, he said at last, is who wins. It had never occurred to me to ask. He looked bored, and I remembered that the pictures in the magazine showed the wearers of the careful costumes for rink and pond skating as having rather blank eyes that looked illimitably bored. I have hopes of the rocker and the mohawk. I might acquire a proper costume for skating on a small river if I could learn what it is, but a bored look? Why, even hockey does not bore me unless I stop to watch it. I don't wonder that those who play it look bored. Even Alexander, who played a more imaginative game than hockey, was bored. Poor fellow, he should have taken up fancy skating in his youth. I never heard of a human being who pretended to a complete conquest of it. I like pond skating best by moonlight. The hollow among the hills will always have a bit of mist about it, let the sky be clear as it may. The moonlight, which seems so lucid and brilliant when you look up, is all pearl and smoke round the pond and the hills. The shore that was like iron under your heel as you came down to the ice is vague when you look back at it from the center of the pond, as the memory of a dream. The motion is like flying in a dream. You float free, and the world floats under you. Your velocity is without effort and without accomplishment, for, speed as you may, you leave nothing behind and approach nothing. You look upward. The mist is overhead now. You see the moon in a hollow halo at the bottom of an icy crystal cup, and you yourself are in just such another. The mist, palely opalescent, drives past her out of nothing into nowhere. Like yourself, she is the center of a circle of vague limit and vaguer content, where passes a swift, ceaseless stream of impression through a faintly luminous halo of consciousness. If by moonlight the mist plays upon the emotions like faint, bewitching music, in sunlight it is scarcely less. More often than not, when I go for my skating to our cozy little river, a winding mile from the mill dam to the railroad trestle, the hills are clothed in silver mist which frames them in vignettes with blurred edges. The tone is that of Japanese paintings on white silk, their color showing soft and dull through the frost powder with which the air is filled. At the mill dam the hockey players furiously rage together, but I heed them not, and in a moment am beyond the first bend, where their clamor comes softened on the air like that of a distant convention of politic crows. The silver powder has fallen on the ice, just enough to cover earlier tracings and leave me a fresh plate to etch with grapevines and arabesques. The stream winds ahead like an unbroken road, striped across with soft-edged shadows of violet, indigo, and lavender. On one side it is bordered with leaning birch, oak, maple, hickory, and occasional groups of hemlocks, under which the very air seems tinged with green. On the other, rounded masses of scrub oak and alder roll back from the edge of the ice like clouds of reddish smoke. The river narrows and turns, then spreads into a swamp, where I weave my curves round the straw-colored tussocks. Here, new as the snow is, there are earlier tracks than mine. 
a crow has traced his parallel hieroglyph alternate footprints with long dashes where he trailed his middle toe as he lifted his foot and his spur as he brought it down under a low shrub that has hospitably scattered its seed is a dainty close-wrought embroidery of tiny bird feet in irregular curves woven into a circular pattern a silent glide towards the bank where among bare twigs little forms flit and swing with low conversational notes brings me in company with a working crew of pine siskins methodically rifling seed cones of birch and alder chattering sotto voce the while under a leaning hemlock the writing on the snow tells of a squirrel that dropped from the lowest branch hopped aimlessly about for a few yards then went up the bank further on where the river narrows again a flutter-headed rabbit crossing at top speed has made a line seemingly as free from frivolous indirection as if it had been defined by all the ponderosities of mathematics there is no pursuing track was it his own shadow he fled or the shadow of hawk the mist now lies along the base of the hills leaving the upper ridges almost imperceptibly veiled and the rounded tops faintly softened the snowy slopes are etched with brush and trees so fine and soft that they remind me of durier's engravings the fur of st jeremy's lion the cock's feathers in the coat of arms with the skull from behind the veil of the southernmost hill comes a faint note as from undiscoverable lips that blow an immaterial horn it is the first far premonition of the noon train i pause and watch long for the next sign at last i hear its throbbing which ceases as it pauses at the flag station under the hill there the invisible locomotive shoots a column of silver vapor above the surface of the mist breaking in rounded clouds at the top looking like nothing so much as the photograph of the explosion of a submarine mine a titanic outburst of force in static pose a geyser of atomized water standing like a frosted elm tree then quick puffs of dusky smoke the volley of which does not reach my ear till the train has stuck its black head out of fairyland and become a prosaic reminder of dinner high on its narrow trestle it leaps across my little river and disappears between the sandbanks far behind it the mist is again spreading into its even layers silence is renewed and i can hear the musical creaking of four starlings in an apple tree as they eviscerate a few rotten apples on the upper branches i turn and spin down the curves and reaches of the river without delaying for embroideries or arabesques at the mill dam the hockey game still rages the players take no heed of the noon train let zal and rustum bluster as they will or hatem call to supper their minds and eyes are intent on a battered disk of hard rubber i begin to think i have misjudged them when i consider what effort of imagination must be involved in the concentration of the faculties on such an object transcending the call of hunger and the lure of beauty is it to them as is to the mystic the great syllable om whereby he attains nirvana i cannot attain it i can but wonder what the hockey players win one half so precious as the stuff they miss end of essay twenty eight essay twenty nine of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty nine trivia by logan pearsall smith it would be extravagant to claim that Pearsall Smith's Trivia, the remarkable little book from which these miniature essays are extracted, is well known. It is too daintily, fragile, and absurd and sophisticated to appeal to a very large public. But it has a cohort of its own devotees and fanatics, and since its publication in 1917 it has become a sort of password in a secret brotherhood or intellectual suicide club i say suicide advisedly for mr smith's irony is glitteringly edged its incision is so keen that the reader is often unaware the razor edge has turned against himself 
until he perceives the wound to be fatal pearsall smith was in a way one of the men of the nineties but he had repressions an excellent thing to have brothers most of the great literature is founded on judicious repressions he came of an excellent old intellectual quaker family down in the philadelphia region his father if we remember rightly was one of walt whitman's staunchest friends in the camden days but when the strong wine of the nineties was foaming in the vats and noggins mr smith so we imagine it at least was still too close to that guarded education in morals and manners that he had had at haverford college pennsylvania and further tinctured with docility at harvard and balliol to give full rein to his inward gush of hilarious satirics like a strong silent man he held in that wellspring of champagne and mercury until many many years later when it came out in nineteen o two he first began to print his trivia privately the book was published by doubleday in nineteen seventeen it sparkled all the more tenderly for its long cellarage but we must be statistical logan pearsall smith was born at melville new jersey in eighteen sixty five as a boy he lived in philadelphia and germantown do you know germantown it is a foothill of that mountain range whereof parnassus and olivet are twin peaks and was three years at haverford in the class of eighty five he went to harvard for a year then to balliol college oxford where he took his degree in eighteen ninety three ever since then a hue he has lived in england stonehenge they sit there forever on the dim horizon of my mind that stonehenge circle of elderly disapproving faces faces of the uncles and schoolmasters and tutors who frowned on my youth in the bright centre and sunlight i leap i caper i dance my dance but when i look up i see they are not deceived for nothing ever placates them nothing ever moves to a look of approval that ring of bleak old contemptuous faces the stars battling my way homeward one dark night against the wind and rain a sudden gust stronger than the others drove me back into the shelter of a tree but soon the western sky broke open the illumination of the stars poured down from behind the dispersing clouds I was astonished at their brightness, to see how they fill the night with their soft luster. So I went my way accompanied by them. Arcturus followed me, and, becoming entangled in a leafy tree, shone by glimpses, and then emerged triumphant, lord of the western sky. Moving along the road in the silence of my own footsteps, my thoughts were among the constellations. I was one of the princes of the starry universe in me also there was something that was not insignificant and mean and of no account the spider what shall i compare it to this fantastic thing i call my mind to a waste paper basket to a sieve choked with sediment or to a barrel full of floating froth and refuse no what it is really most like is a spider's web insecurely hung on leaves and twigs quivering in every wind and sprinkled with dewdrops and dead flies and at its centre pondering forever the problem of existence sits motionless the spider-like and uncanny soul l'oiseau bleu what is it i have more than once asked myself what is it that i am looking for in my walks about london sometimes it seems to me as if i were following a bird a bright bird that sings sweetly as it floats about from one place to another when i find myself however among persons of middle age and settled principles see them moving regularly to their offices what keeps them going i ask myself and i feel ashamed of myself and my bird there is though a philosophic doctrine i studied it at college and i know that many serious people believe it which maintains that all men in spite of appearances and pretensions all live alike for pleasure this theory certainly brings portly respected persons very near to me indeed with a sense of low complicity i have sometimes watched a bishop was he too on the hunt for pleasure solemnly pursuing his bird i see the world 
but you go nowhere see nothing of the world my cousin said now though i do go sometimes to the parties to which i am now and then invited i find as a matter of fact that i get really much more pleasure by looking in at windows and have a way of my own of seeing the world and of summer evenings when motors hurry through the late twilight and the great houses take on airs of inscrutable expectation i go owling out through the dusk and wandering toward the west lose my way in unknown streets an unknown city of revels and when a door opens and a bediamonded lady moves to her motor over carpets unrolled by powdered footmen i can easily think her some great courtesan or some half-believed duchess hurrying to card-tables and lit candles and strange scenes of joy i like to see that there are still splendid people on this flat earth and at dances standing in the street with the crowd and stirred by the music the lights the rushing sound of voices i think the ladies as beautiful as stars who move up those lanes of light past our rows of vagabond faces the young men look like lords in novels and if it has once or twice happened people i know go by me they strike me as changed and wrapped beyond my sphere and when on hot nights windows are left open and i can look in at dinner parties as i peer through lace curtains and window flowers at the silver the women's shoulders the shimmer of their jewels and the divine attitudes of their heads as they lean and listen i imagine extraordinary intrigues and unheard-of wines and passions the church of england i have my anglican moments and as i sat there that sunday afternoon in the palladian interior of the london church and listened to the unexpressive voices chanting the correct service i felt a comfortable assurance that we were in no danger of being betrayed into any unseemly manifestations of religious fervour we had not gathered together at that performance to abase ourselves with furious hosannas before any dark creator of an untamed universe no deity of freaks and miracles and sinister hocus-pocus but to pay our duty to a highly respected anglican first cause undemonstrative gentlemanly and conscientious whom without loss of self-respect we could decorously praise consolation the other day depressed on the underground i tried to cheer myself by thinking over the joys of our human lot but there wasn't one of them for which i seemed to care a button not wine nor friendship nor eating nor making love nor the consciousness of virtue was it worth while then going up in a lift into a world that had nothing less trite to offer then i thought of reading the nice and subtle happiness of reading this was enough this joy not dulled by age this polite and unpunished vice this selfish serene lifelong intoxication the kaleidoscope i find in my mind in its miscellany of ideas and musings a curious collection of little landscapes and pictures shining and fading for no reason sometimes they are views in no way remarkable the corner of a road a heap of stones an old gate but there are many charming pictures too as i read between my eyes and book the moon sheds down on harvest fields her chill of silver i see autumnal avenues with the leaves falling or swept in heaps and storms blow among my thoughts with the rain beating forever on the fields then winter's upward glare of snow appears or the pink and delicate green of spring in the windy sunshine or cornfields and green waters and youths bathing in summer's golden heats and as i walk about certain places haunt me a cathedral rises above a dark blue foreign town the colour of ivory in the sunset light now i find myself in a french garden full of lilacs and bees and shut-in sunshine with the mediterranean lounging and washing outside its walls now in a little college library with busts and the green reflected light of oxford lawns and again i hear the bells reminding me of the familiar oxford hours the poplar there is a great tree in sussex whose cloud of thin foliage floats high in the summer air 
the thrush sings in it and blackbirds who fill the late decorative sunshine with a shimmer of gold sound there the nightingale finds her green cloister and on those branches sometimes like a great fruit hangs the lemon-coloured moon in the glare of august when all the world is faint with heat there is always a breeze in those cool recesses always a noise like the noise of water among its lightly hung leaves but the owner of this tree lives in london reading books End of essay twenty nine Essay 30 of Modern Essays Selected by Christopher Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 30 Beyond Life by James Branch Cabell. To my taste, Beyond Life, an all night soliloquy put into the mouth of the author's alter ego, Charteris, is the most satisfying of Mr. Cabell's books its point of view is deftly sharpened its manner is urbane and charming without posture or allegorical pseudo-romantics from this book i have taken the two closing sections which form a beautiful and significant whole james branch cabell born in richmond virginia in eighteen seventy nine graduated from william and mary college in eighteen ninety eight he had some newspaper experience in richmond and on the new york herald and began publishing in nineteen o four not until nineteen fifteen until mr mcbride the new york publisher and his untiring literary assistant mr guy holt to whom much of cabell's appreciation is due began their work did critics begin to take him at all seriously since that time mr cabell's reputation has been enormously enhanced by the idiotic suppression of his novel jurgen the cabell cult has been almost too active in zeal but there can be no doubt of his very real and refreshing imaginative talent i ask of literature precisely those things of which i feel the lack in my own life i appeal for charity and implore that literature afford me what i cannot come by in myself for i want distinction for that existence which ought to be peculiarly mine among my innumerable fellows who swarm about earth like ants yet which one of us is noticeably or can be appreciably different in this throng of human ephemera and all their millions and inestimable millions of millions of predecessors and oncoming progeny and even though one mote may transiently appear exceptional the distinction of those who in their heydays are great personages much as the emperor of lilliput overtopped his subjects by the breadth of captain gulliver's nail must suffer loss with time and must dwindle continuously until at most the man's recorded name remains here and there in sundry pedants libraries there were how many dynasties of pharaohs each one of whom was absolute lord of the known world and is to-day forgotten among the countless popes who one by one were adored as the regent of heaven upon earth how many persons can to-day distinguish and does not time breed emperors and czars and presidents as plentiful as blackberries and as little thought of when their season is out for there is no perpetuity in human endeavour we strut upon a quicksand and all that any man may do for good or ill is presently forgotten because it does not matter i wail to a familiar tune of course in this lament for the evanescence of human grandeur and the perishable renown of kings and indeed to the statement that imperial caesar is turned to clay and mizraim now cures wounds and that in short queen anne is dead we may agree lightly enough for it is after all a matter of no personal concern but how hard it is to concede that the banker and the rector and the traffic officer to whom we more immediately defer and we ourselves and the little gold heads of our children may be of no importance either in art it may so happen that the thing which a man makes endures to be misunderstood and gabbled over yet it is not the man himself 
we retain the iliad but oblivion has swallowed homer so deep that many question if he ever existed at all so we pass as a cloud of gnats where i want to live and be thought of if only by myself as a distinguishable entity and such distinction is impossible in the long progress of suns whereby in thought to separate the personality of any one man from all others that have lived becomes a task to stagger omniscience i want my life the only life of which i am assured to have symmetry or in default of that at least to acquire some clarity surely it is not asking very much to wish that my personal conduct be intelligible to me yet it is forbidden to know for what purpose this universe was intended to what end it was set a-going or why i am here or even what i had preferably do while here it vaguely seems to me that i am expected to perform an allotted task but as to what it is i have no notion and indeed what have i done hitherto in the years behind me there are some books to show as increment as something which was not anywhere before i made it and which even in bulk will replace my buried body so that my life will be to mankind no loss materially but the course of my life when i look back is as orderless as a trickle of water that is diverted and guided by every pebble and crevice and grass root it encounters i seem to have done nothing with premeditation but rather to have had things done to me and for all the rest of my life as i know now i shall have to shave every morning in order to be ready for no more than this i have attempted to make the best of my material circumstances always nor do i see to-day how any widely varying course could have been wiser or even feasible but material things have nothing to do with that life which moves in me why then should they direct and heighten and provoke and curb every action of life it is against the tyranny of matter i would rebel against life's absolute need of food and books and fire and clothing and flesh to touch and to inhabit lest life perish no all that which i do here or refrain from doing lacks clarity nor can i detect any symmetry anywhere such as living would surely display i think if my progress were directed by any particular motive it is all a muddling through somehow without any recognizable goal in view and there is no explanation of the scuffle tendered or anywhere procurable it merely seems that to go on living has become with me a habit and i want beauty in my life i have seen beauty in a sunset and in the spring woods and in the eyes of diverse women but now these happy accidents of light and colour no longer thrill me and i want beauty in my life itself rather than in such chances as befall it it seems to me that many actions of my life were beautiful very long ago when i was young in an evanished world of friendly girls who were all more lovely than any girl is nowadays for women now are merely more or less good-looking and as i know their looks when at their best have been painstakingly enhanced and edited but i would like this life which moves and yearns in me to be able itself to attain to comeliness though but in transitory performance the life of a butterfly for example is just a graceful gesture and yet in that its loveliness is complete and perfectly rounded in itself i envy this bright flicker through existence and the nearest i can come to my ideal is punctiliously to pay my bills be polite to my wife and contribute to deserving charities and the programme does not seem somehow quite adequate there are my books i know and there is beauty embalmed and treasured up in many pages of my books and in the books of other persons too which i may read at will but this desire inborn in me is not to be satiated by making marks upon paper nor by deciphering them in short i am enamoured of that flawless beauty of which all poets have perturbedly divined the existence somewhere and which life as men know it simply does not afford nor anywhere foresee and tenderness too 
but does that appear a mawkish thing to desiderate in life well to my finding human beings do not like one another indeed why should they being rational creatures all babies have a temporary lean on tenderness of course and therefrom children too receive a dwindling income although on looking back you will recollect that your childhood was upon the whole a lonesome and much put upon period but all grown persons ineffably distrust one another in courtship i grant you there is a passing aberration which often mimics tenderness sometimes as the result of honest delusion but more frequently as an ambuscade in the endless struggle between man and woman married people are not ever tender with each other you will notice if they are mutually civil it is much and physical contacts apart their relation is that of a very moderate intimacy my own wife at all events i find an unfailing mystery a sphinx whose secrets i assume to be not worth knowing and as i am mildly thankful to narrate she knows very little about me and evinces as to my affairs no morbid interest that is not to assert that if i were ill she would not nurse me through any imaginable contagion nor that if she were drowning i would not plunge in after her whatever my delinquencies at swimming what i mean is that pending such high crises we tolerate each other amicably and never think of doing more and from our blood kin we grow apart inevitably their lives and their interests are no longer the same as ours and when we meet it is with conscious reservations and much manufactured talk besides they know things about us which we resent and with the rest of my fellows i find that convention orders all our dealings even with children and we do and say what seems more or less expected and i know that we distrust one another all the while and instinctively conceal or misrepresent our actual thoughts and emotions when there is no very apparent need personally i do not like human beings because i am not aware upon the whole of any generally distributed qualities which entitle them as a race to admiration and affection but toward people in books such as mrs millamont and helen of troy and bella wilfer and melusine and beatrix esmond i may intelligently overflow with tenderness and caressing words in part because they deserve it and in part because i know they will not suspect me of being queer or of having ulterior motives and i very often wish that i could know the truth about just any one circumstance connected with my life is the phantasmagoria of sound and noise and color really passing or is it all an illusion here in my brain how do you know that you are not dreaming me for instance in your conceited dreams i am sure you must invent and see and listen to persons who for the while seem quite as real to you as i do now as i do you observe i say and what thing is it to which i so glibly refer as i if you will try to form a notion of yourself of the sort of a something that you suspect to inhabit and partially to control your flesh and blood body you will encounter a walking bundle of superfluities and when you mentally have put aside the extraneous things your garments and your members and your body and your acquired habits and your appetites and your inherited traits and your prejudices and all other appurtenances which considered separately you recognize to be no integral part of you there seems to remain in those pearl-coloured brain cells wherein is your ultimate lair very little save a faculty for receiving sensations of which you know the larger portion to be illusory and surely to be just a very gullible consciousness provisionally existing among inexplicable mysteries is not an enviable plight and yet this life to which i cling tenaciously comes to no more meanwhile i hear men talk about the truth and they even wager handsome sums upon their knowledge of it but i align myself with jesting pilot and echo the forlorn query that recorded time has left unanswered then last of all i desiderate urbanity i believe this is the rarest quality in the world indeed it probably does not exist anywhere 
a really urbane person a mortal open-minded and affable to conviction of his own shortcomings and errors and unguided in anything by irrational blind prejudices could not but in a world of men and women be regarded as a monster we are all of us as if by instinct intolerant of that which is unfamiliar we resent its impudence and very much the same principle which prompts small boys to jeer at a straw hat out of season induces their elders to send missionaries to the heathen the history of the progress of the human race is but the picaresque romance of intolerance a narrative of how what is it milton says truth never came into the world but like a bastard to the ignominy of him that brought her forth till time hath washed and salted the infant declared her legitimate and churched the father of his young minerva and i who prattle to you very candidly confess that i have no patience with other people's ideas unless they coincide with mine for if the fellow be demonstrably wrong i am fretted by his stupidity and if his notions seem more nearly right than mine i am infuriated yet i wish i could acquire urbanity very much as i would like to have wings for in default of it i cannot even manage to be civil to that piteous thing called human nature or to view its parasites whether they be politicians or clergymen of popular authors with one half the commiseration which the shifts they are put to quite certainly would rouse to the urbane so i in point of fact desire of literature just as you guessed precisely those things of which i most poignantly and most constantly feel the lack in my own life and it is that which romance affords her postulants the filters of romance are brewed to free us from this unsatisfying life that is calendared by fiscal years and to contrive a less disastrous illusion of our own personalities than many seek dispersedly in drink and drugs and lust and fanaticism and sometimes in death for beset by his own rationality the normal man is goaded to evade the strictures of his normal life upon the incontestable ground that it is a stupid and unlovely routine and to escape likewise from his own personality which bores him quite as much as it does his associates so he hurtles into these very various roads from reality precisely as a goaded sheep flees without notice of what lies ahead and romance tricks him but not to his harm for be it remembered that man alone of animals plays the ape to his dreams romance it is undoubtedly who whispers to every man that life is not a blind and aimless business not all a hopeless waste and confusion and that his existence is a pageant appreciatively observed by divine spectators and that he is strong and excellent and wise and to romance he listens willing and thrice willing to be cheated by the honeyed fiction the things of which romance assures him are very far from true yet it is solely by believing himself a creature but little lower than the cherubim that man has by interminable small degrees become upon the whole distinctly superior to the chimpanzee so that however extravagant may seem these flattering whispers to-day they were immeasurably more remote from veracity when men first began to listen to their sugared susurrus and steadily the discrepancy lessens to-day these things seem quite as preposterous to calm consideration as did flying yesterday and so to the gradgridians romance appears to discourse foolishly and incurs the common fate of prophets for it is about to-morrow and about the day after to-morrow that romance is talking by means of parables and all the while man plays the ape to fairer and yet fairer dreams and practice strengthens him at mimicry to what does the whole business tend why how in heaven's name should i know we can but be content to note that all goes forward toward something it may be that we are nocturnal creatures perturbed by rumours of a dawn which comes inevitably as prologue to a day wherein we and our children have no part whatever 
it may be that when our arboreal propositus descended from his palm-tree and began to walk upright about the earth his progeny were forthwith committed to a journey in which to-day is only a way-station yet i prefer to take it that we are components of an unfinished world and that we are but as seething atoms which ferment toward its making if merely because man as he now exists can hardly be the finished product of any creator whom one could very heartily revere we are being made into something quite unpredictable i imagine and through the purging and the smelting we are sustaining by an instinctive knowledge that we are being made into something better for this we know quite incommunicably and yet as surely as we know that we will to have it thus and it is this will that stirs in us to have the creatures of earth and the affairs of earth not as they are but as they ought to be which we call romance but when we note how visibly it sways all life we perceive that we are talking about god end of essay thirty